Uh, We're going to look together at Mark chapter number 15 and Mark chapter number 16. And I know that's two completely different um, chapters in the Bible, but don't worry, I'm not going to hold you long. I promise you, I'll get you out. I know we got egg hunts to do. Uh, Trust me, our little three-year-old uh, Judah has been reminding me over and over and over again, hey, like, you know, church needs to be short because I've, I've got some, some Easter egg hunts to do. I got some candy to get. I got some toys to get. But now he probably just wants to stay because back in the kids area, they are just set up for a time. I don't know if, if you have kids and drop them off back there, but I was talking to another parent before church and they said, man, it just looks like they're going to have a blast back there. And they were like, you know, I kind of think maybe I want to be back there. And I was like, I'll not be offended with that. I, I promise I won't be offended with that. But it's an awesome, awesome time that they're having back there. I would, I, I just, I'm so a little bit jealous, but at the same time, I'm excited about what God's going to do in here and what we're going to see take place in here on this Easter Sunday morning. And I want us to look at Mark chapter number 15 and Mark chapter number 16. And here Jesus has made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We celebrated this last week. And then he has also also been betrayed by his disciple Judas. He has been arrested. He has been put on trial. He has been crucified on the cross. And now he has been dead for, for three days. But before we get into that in chapter 16 and chapter 15, we see the moment that he is still on the cross. Still hanging on the cross, these last moments of Jesus on the cross in Mark 15 and verse 37, it says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath. Now, what you have to understand here is that the disciples and the followers of Jesus, those who were with Jesus and his family, they, they were freaking out when this happened. Jesus was not surprised by any of this, but they were. Not because Jesus had not told them that it would happen, but simply because They did not believe Jesus when he told them that it was going to happen. But it says that a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurions who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The centurion saw how he died and then said, surely this man was the son of God. Why is it? that people always wait until you're dead to say nice things about you. I mean, have you ever noticed this? Like, you ever notice how people wait until somebody has died and then they say all these nice things? And you know, you're like, I've heard you say some stuff about them that was not as nice as the things that you're saying. You know what I mean? Like people, it's like they say all the mean things, all the hurtful things to your face, and then when you die, they want to say all the nice things. Can I just let somebody know, for me, myself, if you would like to, please say the nice things to my face. And then after I die, you can say whatever you want about me. It doesn't matter because I won't be here. But the centurion, he looks and he's like, oh, surely this man was the son of God now that he's dead. Jesus breathed his last breath. And then we see in Mark chapter number 16, Jesus has died. He's been buried. He's been in the tomb for three days. He's now risen. And two ladies named Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, they show up to the tomb to see Jesus. And when they get there, the tombstone has been rolled away and they freak out because who wouldn't? Who wouldn't show up to a tomb area and freak out when the stone has now been rolled away? They thought he was, had been stolen. They didn't know what had taken place. And it says in Mark 16, verse five, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now again, why wouldn't they be alarmed? I would be alarmed. You would be alarmed. I know like people who have been in church for 30 years are like, oh, I wouldn't be alarmed. Jesus told them that he would do it. No, the truth is any of us would have been alarmed. Jesus could have told us whatever he wanted to tell us. But if we rolled into a tomb and then we look over and there's this dude in all white just sitting there smiling at us, we'd be freaking out too. We'd be alarmed. But he tries to calm them down and he says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. 
See, before there could ever be a resurrection, there first had to be a death. And when Jesus died, the disciples, the the followers of Jesus, his family, even his enemies, thought that it was the end for Jesus. They thought that it was over for Jesus, that that was was it, that his purpose was over, that his plan was over, that his story was over, because usually whenever it sounds like the end, whenever it looks like the end, whenever it feels like the end, guess what? It's the end. It's the end. And, and I don't know everybody here today. I'd love to have a chance to meet you out after service outside. Uh, those of you joining us online, I don't know everybody here or online. But what I do know is that we all have times in our lives. We all have moments in our lives, circumstances in our lives where we think that it's the end. We all have times in our lives where people have told us that it's the end that our calling is over, that our purpose is over, that our worth has ended, that our value is no longer there. We've all had moments where it, it seemed like the end, and that's exactly what the disciples felt in this moment. They felt like it was the end because Jesus, their Savior, their Lord, has died on this cross, and it was all over. And they felt like it was the end, but the amazing thing is it was only the beginning. When they thought that it was all over, it was only the beginning. And the beautiful thing about the resurrection is that it teaches us that even when it seems like the end, even when it feels over with Jesus, it's not the end. With Jesus, It's not over. So I want to talk to you this morning for a few moments together on this subject. This is not the end. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the reason we're here to celebrate today, which is Jesus coming down to this earth, giving his life for us so that we might have eternal life with him and also be empowered on this earth. Lord, I pray that you would be with those who are here today and online that may feel rejected, that may feel confused, that may feel conflicted, may feel worthless, may feel unloved, may feel like they have it all together. God, wherever we're at in our lives, I pray that you would just wrap your arms around us. Help us to know that you are with us, that you love us so much that Jesus came down and gave his life for us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear from you today, to receive from you today, not to hear anything that I have to say, but to hear what you have to say in our lives, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but have you ever heard of somebody doing something or seen somebody do something, and then because they did it, you thought, you know what? I could do this thing. Because that person did it, surely I can do this thing. That's how I am when it comes to baking, okay? Now, something you gotta know about me is I am not a master baker. I'm not a, I'm I'm really not even a great baker or a great cook. I'm average. Right? And what I mean by that is I'm not great, but I'm not terrible. So if you give me instructions on a recipe, then I can follow those instructions. But if you just try to get me to go into the kitchen and just start putting stuff together, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be catastrophic. Now I can throw down on the grill Okay, let me just say, I can throw down on the grill. But when it comes into the kitchen, I'm just not quite as good. Now, my wife, she can just bust up in the kitchen, just hand her some ingredients. She'll just do whatever, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and it tastes amazing. For me, I got to follow the step-by-step instructions. So generally, I'm the sous chef, and I do whatever she tells me to do. And it's just, that's the smart thing to do for any guy out there wanting to get married, whatever it may be. You just, you just follow the instructions. So, so she'll tell me what to do and I'll do it. Or, or I also, I do the dishes. I wash the dishes because I'm like, hey, you had to dirty the dishes. I'm going to wash the dishes. But I, every once in a while, I get a little ambitious. And the reason I get ambitious is because we watch all the baking shows. Like the Great British Baking Championship, which is one of my all-time favorite shows. It's on Netflix. And so this past summer, we're watching it, and I got to feeling like I could do what they were doing. And that's the problem with these shows, because on the Great British Baking Championship, they tell you that they're all home bakers, right? So I'm like, I'm a home baker. (laughs) 
we have this in common. Like, we share this together. Like, you bake at home, I bake at home. So surely, if you can do it, I can do it. And I get this false sense of confidence based on them being able to do it. And so then I see what they're doing, and I'm like, hey, I think I can do that too. And this past summer, our favorite person on the show, his name was Peter. He was about 19 years old. And I told Nicole, I'm like, if this 19-year-old home baker dude can do this, I can do it at 31, right? Like, I can do what he's doing. It's no problem. And so we're watching it, and one of his techniques that he did was he would take things out of the oven, and he would listen to it. And when he listened to it, he would say, it sounds like it's done. Or he would listen to it and he'd say, and I'm not making this up, go watch it. He would say, it sounds like it needs five more minutes. And then he would look at the camera so happy and excited and cocky because he's just the best baker ever. And he would just say, yeah, you know, I've just, it's something I've developed over time and I'm able to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah. So I told Nicole, I was like, I don't believe that. Right? Like, he's not really, that's, that's, I don't trust that. I think that's fake because I didn't need her to think that some 19 year old punk was better baker than I am. So I'm like, that's not real. There's no way that's true. You know, there's no way he can actually do that. It's all made up. But what she doesn't know, and she's gonna find out today with the rest of you, is that I actually went and tried this technique out myself. <laughs> because while I didn't believe it, I had to try it myself. I'm like, if Peter can do it, I can do it. You know, so I go and something was in the oven and I, I pulled it out of the oven. It was like a casserole. And I pulled it out of the oven and I went to listen to it. And I'm like, it sounds done, you know? And, and, and our little three-year-old son, Judah, comes around the corner just in time and he's like, Daddy, what are you doing? And I was like, mind your business, go watch a show, you know? It's, it's no big deal. Don't tell your mother. And so I'm like, it sounds done. So I take it out and I cut into it. I'm like, babe, it's done. I'm turning off the oven. I cut into it and it was straight liquid. <laughs> like, I didn't hear anything, right? He said, when you listen to it, it will bubble if it's still cooking. And I'm listening and I don't hear any bubbles, so I was like, you know what? To me, it sounds like it's done. It sounded like it. So now I know that I just need to stick to the basics and go back to what I've always done. But he said it sounds like it. And what we do so often in our lives is we make decisions based on what it sounds like. We make choices based on what it sounds like. We develop our belief system based on on what it sounds like. Well, I've always heard this before, or I've always heard somebody else say this, or I heard them tell me that, and we make our mind up based on what we hear. And it was no different in Mark chapter 15 and verse 37. It said, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath. With a loud cry. With a loud cry, he breathed his last. Now, the Bible is intentional in the words that it uses. In that, it does not say simply, he breathed his last. It doesn't say with a cry, he breathed his last. It says with a loud cry, he breathed his last. In other words, it was a cry that let everybody else around there know it's over. It was a cry that let everybody else around know this is the end. It was a cry of pain. It was a cry of anguish. It said that Jesus cried out loudly and then breathed his last breath. A cry that, that nobody else around would have been like, I don't know, is he really dead? Like, do you think he's really in pain? Do you think it's really over? He didn't cry. He didn't die peacefully. He died in pain. He died in anguish, and it says it was a loud cry. And I believe that the Bible says it was a loud cry on purpose because it wants us to know that what everybody heard, let them know it was finished. Jesus said, it's finished. And then he let out this loud cry so everybody knew that it was actually done. It was over. And everybody around there, based on what they heard, thought that it was over. And thousands of years have passed, and yet we still do the exact same thing, don't we? We still 
make decisions based on what we hear. We, we make decisions based on what it sounds like. We, we think that things are over based on what we hear. We allow what we hear to dictate what we feel. We allow what we hear to dictate what we believe. We allow what we hear to tell us that it's over. That because we heard that it's over, because somebody else told us that it's over, that it's now over. Because we messed up and they said, because you did that, it's over for you. So now we think, okay, it must be over. We allow what we hear around us to tell us that it's the end. That because our marriage fell apart, we'll never be able to be loved. That, that because our, our job was at the end, it meant the end of our career. That, that the end of, of the facade that we had built up around us and the walls that we had that made everybody feel like we had it all together, the end of that facade meant that it was the end of our worth. That the end of our perfect streak where we got everything right for a week long meant the end of our value. We allow what we hear to tell us that it is the end. We allow somebody else's opinion to tell us the, that it's the end. We allow people in church to tell us that it's the end. We allow people in our family to tell us that it's the end. We allow everybody else to tell us that something is over except for God to even, we don't even check with him to see God is it really over. We just say what everybody else says. And when they tell us that it's over and that it's the end, then we believe that because of who we were, who we are, or whatever it is, what we did, that it's over for us. That it's ended. We've heard it from others. Sometimes we even hear it from ourselves. Sometimes we tell ourselves that it's the end. We tell ourselves that because of the mistake that we made, it's over. And I will be the first to admit that it is not easy to believe that it is not the end when everything else that we're hearing tells us that it is. It's not easy to believe that it's not over. When what everybody else tells you says, hey, it's over for you. Your best days are behind you. Oh, you're pushing 80? Oh, yeah. You had a good run. You had a good run. Oh, you had a kid out of wedlock? Oh, well, you're done for. Oh, your marriage didn't make it. Your second marriage didn't make it. Your third marriage didn't make it. Oh, you're done for. Because of what you look like, you're done for. We allow, we have people telling us all the time that we are done for for certain things, but we also will tell ourselves that we're finished. And I'll admit it is not easy not to believe that because we hear it over and over and over again from so many different places. Or maybe for you it's not what you hear, maybe for you it's what you don't hear. Maybe it's the silence that causes you to feel like it's over. It said that Jesus breathed his last breath. Can you imagine how deafening the silence had to be in that moment? In that moment when Jesus cried out, breathed his last breath, the, 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 the silence that had to feel, people would be mourning, people would be crying, some people were rejoicing. But for those who were following Jesus, it had to feel so empty and so silent in their lives as they watched their Savior die on the cross. Maybe you think it's the end not because of what you've been hearing. Maybe you think it's the end because of what you don't hear. Maybe it's because you haven't heard that you're valuable. Maybe it's because you haven't heard that you are loved. Maybe it's because you haven't heard that you're not worthless. Maybe it's because you haven't heard that you're not a mistake. Maybe it's because you haven't heard somebody tell you that you matter. Maybe it's in the silence that has caused us to feel like it's the end. Because, see, one thing I know is when we make mistakes that everybody wants to desert us. Whenever we're not following everybody else's set of rules, then we turn around and we feel like it's silent. People were there when everything was good, but now I'm in this mess and I've made a mistake. And nobody's there. Or maybe you got it all together and people deserted you because... All they wanted was for you to give them everything and, and help them and, and, and let yourself be run over to help them. And, and because you couldn't keep giving out and giving out and giving out, then they deserted you. There's moments where the silence is more deafening than the sound. Maybe this morning for you, it's not the noise 
of your life, but it's the silence of your life. Maybe you've heard that it was the end for so long. Or maybe you haven't heard that it's not the end for so long that you've started to believe it. You started to say, you know what, maybe it is. Or, or, or what about this? Maybe for you it's not what it sounds like or it's not the silence, but maybe for you it's the fact that it looks like it. Maybe for you when you look at your life, it looks like the end. When you actually step back and you take a peek at your life, it looks like like the end. Not only did it sound like the end when Jesus died, it looked like the end. He was hanging on a cross. He looked dead because he was dead, and it looked like the end. It said in verse 39, when the centurion who, saw, who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died. When he saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. When the centurion saw how he died. Now, the centurion was not the only one watching. Everybody else was standing around watching as their Savior, as the Lord, breathed his last breath and died. They, they saw it. And I, I want you to understand this because it's easy. Sometimes it's a little easier whenever you just hear that it's over. Right? Sometimes it's easier when you hear something not to believe it. That's why hearsay is inadmissible in court, because it's just hearing it. But when you bring physical, visual evidence, it's impossible to stand against what you see. It's impossible to say, I'm looking at a situation that is dead, and to then sit there and say, eh, it's not really dead. It is so much more difficult because people will talk, right? We know people talk all day long. People got things to say. People will talk. But when you can actually see for yourself everything kind of like falling apart bit by bit, this is where it gets so difficult not to give in and believe that it's the end. Because we're there and we're like, no, like, I, I see it. Like, you say it's not the end. That's cool. But I see it. Like, what I am looking at is over. What I am looking at is the definition of the end. Any chance that I had at seeing life in that is over. And what we're so good about doing in church, and even if you're not from a church background, maybe you've heard this before from somebody who, who goes to church, but we're so good at saying things like, well, it may look done, but God's not finished. We're so good in church at saying things like, like even when I don't see it, you're working. We're so good at church at, at labeling messages, titling messages, this is not the end. We're so good at that. But the truth is, and, and it's going to get me in a little bit of trouble, and it's okay, it's going to get me some angry emails, but I'm going to say it anyways because it doesn't matter because it's truth. The truth that nobody wants to admit is that it is easy to tell somebody else all of those things about their own situations. It is easy to say all of those things when you see at least a glimmer of life left in the situation that you're facing. It is easy to say all those things, but the struggle is, what do you do when you look at your situation and there is not a glimmer of hope left. There is not an ounce of life left. What do you do when you look at your own life and instead of having to tell somebody else, yeah, I know your life's falling apart, but God is good and it's going to be okay. What do you do when you look at your own life and your own life is the one that's falling apart? What do you do when, when you have to look, step back and say, I had this planned and I had that planned and I had this thing and, and that thing and, and now it's all ruined? or it's not going the way that I thought it would. When we step back and we have to say that chance of reconciling with my children is over. That chance of restoring my marriage is over. That chance of overcoming the addiction is over. What do we do in the moments when we have to step back and we look at our own life and what we see is the end? See, with what it sounded like and with what it looked like alone, 
Nobody would have blamed the disciples and the followers of Jesus for thinking that it was the end. Just based on what it looked like, based on what it sounded like, like if you're looking at somebody hanging on a cross that has breathed their last breath, that means they are what? Dead? And for somebody who said that they were going to come and to save mankind, to see them hanging on a cross dead doesn't give you warm, fuzzy feelings inside. It doesn't give you the, see, we're here on Easter Sunday, and, and, and we're celebrating the resurrection, and we're about to get to that. But in this moment, for the disciples and followers of Jesus, Sunday hadn't come yet. They were still in the middle of Friday. And some of us have been in the middle of Friday for what seems like five years, and we're wondering, is Sunday ever going to come? And we hear people telling us over and over and over again, God is good, God is good, God is good. But then whenever we start to struggle believing that because of what we're seeing or because of what we're hearing, then they abandon us. But Jesus is so great. That literally everyone in your family, every one of your friends, everyone in the capital C church, and the, everyone could abandon you, but Jesus is so great that he still stands there. Jesus is so great that the times that you cursed him, the times that you said you wanted nothing to do with him, the times that you said he didn't know what he was doing and that you knew better, all of those times he pushed through that and he still loves you enough to stand there with you. The time that you made the mistake that made your parents excommunicate you, the, the time that you made the mistake that made everybody else forget, Jesus stood there with you in the midst of those moments, and guess what? He'll stand with you in the midst of the mistakes that you're still going to make, because the reality is none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect, but in that moment, nobody would have blamed the disciples or followers of Jesus in that moment. Now here, because what we like to do is we like to look in retrospect, so we're like, well, I can't believe they doubted. Jesus told them he's going to rise again. He told them that he was going to come back. But in that moment, in the middle of that Friday experience, seeing their hope die on a cross caused them not to feel like they had any life left. Caused them to feel like it was the end. And nobody could blame them for that. But there's a slight little caveat here that we see now in retrospect, and that's that Jesus had told them multiple times that he would rise again. And what he told them was that when it looks like the end, when it sounds like the end, the last thing I need you to see today, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Jesus told them over and over and over again. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried and it's going to seem like the end. But when it sounds like the end, when it looks like the end, it is just the beginning. When it seems like it's over, it is just the beginning. And I believe God wants somebody here today, somebody online to know that it is just the beginning. It is not the end for you, but it is just the beginning. It's just the beginning because Mark 15 is a little difficult, but we get to Mark 16 and verse 6, and the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. He said, you are looking for Jesus, but he's not here. You're looking for the one who was dead on the cross. You're looking for the one who didn't make it through that cross experience. You're looking for the one who breathed his last breath on the cross. But he is not here. Instead, he has risen. He has risen. It looked like the end. In other words, the angel said, listen, I know that it seems like the end, but it is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. I don't know, you know, if you played sports when you were growing up, whatever it may be, but for me, when I played uh, sports growing up, my favorite sport was basketball, and I loved basketball, and, and it's just like, all I ever wanted to do, and I say this a lot, but all I ever wanted to do was dunk, okay, and I know we're saying that it's not the end, but that ship has sailed, it is the end for that, it's never going to happen, but, but all I ever wanted to do was dunk, and so I played basketball every day, I mean, every, you know, if it was raining, I'd still play outside until it came 
too hard of a rain. And I played uh, for our school, and I remember our senior year, me and a couple of friends, we thought that it would be a good idea to go to Steak and Shake before coming back to basketball practice. And there was nothing wrong with that in theory except for the fact that our coach was mean. And I love him now, but when I was a kid, he was mean. Now, as an adult, I kind of understand, and I'm like, okay, I get you had to do what you had to do. But we went to Steak and Shake. We had a great time. I didn't eat a burger. I didn't drink a shake because I knew that was a terrible idea. But we're at Steak and Shake, and we lost track of time. And we ended up getting back to practice too late. So practice had already started. And we were the seniors. So our coach was going to make an example of us. And so he said, everybody on the line now. If you ever played basketball, you know what that means. Suicides. Free throw line, back. Half court, back. Other free throw line, back. Other baseline, back. Over and over and over again until he says to stop. And so we're doing this for, no joke, 30 minutes. And the whole time he's like, how's that burger tasting? How's that milkshake? Milkshake tastes good right about now. Did you get some cheese on that burger? You get some ketchup on that burger? Just yelling. And I'm like, dude, I didn't eat a burger. I didn't drink a milkshake. I was just hanging out. And the whole time he made the whole team run because you win as a team and you lose as a team. And I'm carrying that same philosophy into raising our sons, so y'all pray for them. But it's like you win as a team, you lose as a team, and so we're running. And then finally, after about 30 minutes, we stop. He stops us. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. It's like, man, I didn't think that was ever going to end. And he looks at me in my eyes and he says, oh, you thought that was the end? <laughs> he said, no, that's just the beginning. He said, that was the warm up. He said, we're not running drills today. We're not running plays today. We're running suicides all day. But I had to stop for a moment because your friend over there threw up his hamburger on the floor, so we had to stop and just take a moment to clean that up. But now we're going to start back again because you thought that it was the end, but it was really just the beginning. And I know that for some of our lives, it may not sound like it's just the beginning. It may not look like it's just the beginning, but I believe God is telling someone today it is just the beginning. This is not the end. It is not the end. It may feel like the end, but it is not the end. I believe God wants somebody to know that when it looks like the end, when it sounds like the end, it may feel like the end, but God is just getting started. On this Easter Sunday morning, just because it looks like the end in your life, just because it looks like the end of the marriage, just because it looks like the end of your relationship with your children, just because it looks like you'll never be able to fulfill your dreams, just because it sounds like it's over for you, it is just the beginning. This is not the end. Only time I'm going to have you talk today. But somebody say, this is not the end. This is not the end. Type it in the chat. This is not the end. The whole story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection teaches us that in the moment when it seems the most bleak, in the moment when it seems the most impossible, in the moment when it seems like there cannot possibly be any life left, Jesus steps in and he says, it may have looked like the end. Somebody might have told you that it was the end, but it is just the beginning. 